Today's show is sponsored by Divi Cloud. Divi Cloud protects cloud and container environments from policy violations, threats, IAM challenges, and misconfigurations. Types of misconfigurations that have cost enterprises a jaw-dropping $5 trillion over the last two years. Divi Cloud provides continuous security and compliance across all cloud service providers and containers, including AWS, GCP, Azure, Alibaba, and Kubernetes, providing a comprehensive view of what's in your cloud, along with the tools and automation you need to manage it today. Divi Cloud is proving that security and innovation are not mutually exclusive, one customer at a time. Join innovative enterprises like Spotify, Fannie Mae, and Discovery, who have found the freedom to innovate securely without loss of control. To learn more, visit divicloud.com forward slash cloudcast. That's D-I-V-V-Y-C-L-O-U-D dot com slash cloudcast to sign up for a free trial. Divi Cloud. Find your freedom to innovate. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And depending on when you're listening to this, we may already be rolling into October of 2020. Hard to believe we're into. Q4 of 2020, uh, the year that never seems to end. It feels, still feels like March. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope everybody is staying safe and uh, taking care of friends and family and colleagues and so forth. Lots of acquisition news in the cloud news of the week this week. So let's jump right into it. First one is a big move by Microsoft in a, in a sort of, I guess, cloud, but not really cloud way. So Microsoft acquires ZeniMax Media, who are the owners of Bethesda Software, for $7.5 billion dollars. Uh, move to really try and boost their uh, gaming and Xbox business. Um, so not completely a cloud uh, play, but obviously, you know, delivered via the cloud. Um, you know, uh, Bethesda is a company who has, you know, well-known names like uh, The Elder Scrolls, Doom, Fallout. So for those of you that are gamers, um, that's going to mean a lot to you. Uh, this is probably a, a cloud news of the week that Aaron should be doing. He's much more into gaming than I am. But, uh, you know, it's a, a huge industry. Um, obviously, it continues to grow as mobile computing and mobile gaming becomes easier and easier. Um, the uh, the consoles become, uh, you know, more powerful year after year. So uh, interesting to see them spending $7.5 billion, the same amount of money they spent on GitHub uh, just a couple of years ago. So, you know, while some of the different um, parent companies as a cloud providers kind of are are competing with their customers. You know, you see you know, Amazon getting into different things or Google getting into different things. You know, Microsoft still has a sort of all over the place thing, right? There's part of their acquisitions that are, uh, you know, seems to be right in their wheelhouse of, of enterprise IT, things like GitHub. Uh, then you see them getting into like LinkedIn. Now you see them, you know, expanding out in gaming. They're a little more all over the place. I mean, obviously still very technology centric. So interesting to see where Microsoft is spending their money. And now to the long list of acquisitions that have been happening over the last I don't know, a couple days, seven to 10 days. Uh, first on the list, PagerDuty acquired RunDeck for approximately $100 million, uh, RunBook Automation. So PagerDuty, um, you know, company that everybody knows, former sponsor here of the show, uh, you know, really great at notifications, uh, gets into the RunBook Automation space. So, uh, you know, you get a notification and maybe you want to look for an automated way to remedy that notification. So uh, congratulations to the RunDeck team, $100 million acquisition. Um, I know some folks that used to be known as DTO Solutions uh, out of Atlanta. So congratulations to them. Uh, Arista acquired Awake Security for an area that I'd never really heard of this acronym. It's a DTR, or I'm sorry, uh, NDR, so Network Detection and Response, which is what I kind of always thought what security was around, but I guess this is now a specific area. This allows them to compete a little more uh, with Cisco, uh, kind of a lot of uh, braggadocious claims in the uh, acquisition notice about how they've been taking customers from Cisco in the security space. So uh, Arista continues to move into broader spaces than just um, high-speed networking, data center networking, getting more into security. So congratulations to them. And then finally, uh, this week is uh, the week of VMworld. Um, we're not going to really do much coverage of it because it's just starting today. We won't have a chance to kind of analyze it. We'll try and cover a little bit of it next week in Cloud News of the Week. But they did make an early week uh, announcement. Uh, VMware is acquiring SaltStack. So uh, we've seen a run of uh, acquisitions of the security companies. Obviously, you know, the big four always used to be Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and SaltStack. Uh, Ansible got acquired a number of years ago by Red Hat. Uh, Chef recently acquired by, um, shoot, I forget the name of the company, a company none of us had ever heard of. I think it was called Progress Software, if I recall correctly. Uh, and SaltStack now acquired by VMware. So sort of leaves Puppet as the, the last company to be independently owned. Um, no no dollar amount for this acquisition. So uh, you have to assume it's probably 
mm, probably somewhere in the sub 100 million, sub 50 million. I don't want to speculate, but uh, interesting to see VMware uh, getting into uh, automation, a uh, space that they've you know done network management for a long time with vRealize and and so forth. But um, interesting to see this you know huge run on uh, automation companies, especially with um, you know with COVID happening and and all that sort of stuff. So uh, a lot of acquisitions this week. I'm going to kind of wrap up cloud news of the week with that, and I'm kind of excited about this one. You know, every every once in a while we get a chance to to talk about something that's a little bit different. But I think you guys are going to enjoy this next talk. We get a chance to really talk about how people are learning through these new mediums uh, in which streaming is the medium and uh, the engagement model around streaming for new technology learnings, new technology uh, hands-on and uh, multi-way communication. So look forward to that right after the break. Today's show is sponsored by Datadog. Start monitoring EC2, RDS, ECS, and all your other AWS services in minutes with Datadog. Whether you have 10 instances or 10,000, Datadog automatically tracks hosts as you scale. Visualize metrics, automatically alert on anomalies, and collaborate across teams to quickly troubleshoot issues before they escalate. Give it a try with a free 14-day trial by visiting datadog.com slash cloudcast, and Datadog will send you a comfy, complimentary t-shirt. That's datadog.com slash cloudcast. Today's show is sponsored by Cloud Academy. Listen up, y'all. This is a great offer. With everyone using the same cloud platforms, winning and losing comes down to having the best talent to build products better and faster. Cloud Academy is the training platform of choice for Fortune 500 companies and thousands of tech professionals around the world. Thousands of video courses, learning paths, practical hands-on labs in real-world cloud environments, Cloud Academy has tools designed to help teams assess, build, and validate critical cloud skills. Most importantly, Cloud Academy stays agile, challenging you with new content, labs, and tons of features that ensure your skills stay relevant and everyone can level up. They cover everything from cloud certifications to DevOps to security to programming languages. You can get started now at cloudacademy.com. For a limited time, Cloudcast listeners can lock in 50% off the monthly price for life. Just put in the coupon code CLOUDCAST at checkout. It's a great way to pursue certifications or just build cloud expertise. Again, that's cloudacademy.com and use the coupon code CLOUDCAST to lock in 50% off the monthly price. And we're back. And folks, you know, every couple... Every couple of years or every, you know, once or twice a year, we will kind of get off the, the real hardcore kind of cloud learning uh, subjects for the, for the podcast because we know, you know, we're all sort of immersed in it every day. And while we love it, we love learning about new stuff. There's also some times when, you know, we kind of want to just learn about some other things that may help us in unique ways in which we learn, in which we communicate with other people. And sometimes there's just topics that uh, Aaron and I want to learn a little bit more about, and that's going to be what we're going to do this week. So uh, excited to bring back kind of an old friend of the show, somebody who I work with in my day job as well, but uh, excited to have Chris Short on with us today. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Brian. I really appreciate you bringing me on. Yeah. So, uh, you know, beyond having sort of the the, the richest, most, uh, you know, easy to listen to voice in the industry, um, CNCF ambassador, um, you've been on the show before. It's been a couple of years. You were doing yeah. uh, a lot of early DevOps stuff. Um, and you and I work together. You're, uh, you know, we, we both work on at Red Hat on Kubernetes stuff and other things. But you've taken on this sort of new world of sort of streaming content, you know, sort of learning, teaching people about DevOps, containers, Kubernetes, and and everything in, under, under OpenShift TV. So for those that may not know who you are in the, the broader CNCF community, cloud native community, sure. give folks a little bit of background and kind of the, the stuff that you're working on these days. So um, I've been a longtime Kubernetes contributor, right? And one of the things that uh, was needed uh, a couple of years ago, I feel like now, was somebody else to help stream community meetings, right? And when I say stream community meetings, all the Kubernetes community meetings are recorded and live streamed. Um, so they needed somebody with just a rig that could do this, right? Like use a tool called OBS, which is open source broadcast studio. Uh, it's open broadcast studio is the name of it. It's open source software. Um, and you know, just make this meeting in zoom show up in this box on YouTube kind of thing. Right. And then we started saying, well, there's different st- stuff we can do with it right like we can do bumpers we can do intros and things like that and you know it didn't get too complicated in the kubernetes community you know and i helped every once in a while you know i would be i was like i'm like the number third or fourth string person or whatever and Mm -hmm. you know i would stream a meeting every now and then but then one day uh my boss and a coworker talking and one of them had to kick their kids off of twitch and the video game networks because there was no bandwidth for the meeting. And all of a sudden this idea came along. Wait, 
why don't we do live streaming? We're having problems reaching our, you know, like target audience or, you know, our, our jobs as technical marketing managers is to go out and help people solve problems, to demonstrate new solutions, you know, to, to feature products in our demos kind of thing. And yeah, we could build demos all day from afar, but it's next to impossible to go hands on with people unless you create a method and way and way to do that. And we found that like people were getting, and this was back in, you know, April, May or April, I should say, people were already getting virtual event fatigue, right? right? Like that was already happening. So we decided, right? Like, let's just put it out there. It'll be live. Folks can interact with us. And, uh, you know, Chris, congratulations. You have the most experienced streaming. This is your baby now. Uh, it wasn't quite like that, but it was close. Um, and, uh, you know, we've we've put out more than 200 hours of content so far. And we have had just this tremendous embracement of this content in the in a way that we did not think we would get. Right. Like we knew we needed a way to reach people, but we did not know that it would be we would get a following like we have so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'll caveat a little bit if, if folks are listening, like, you know, sometimes you, you get into this uh, kind of inception thing of like, oh, it's, you know, it's podcasters talking about mediums or, you know, uh, streamers right. talking about like my goal today is, is not so much to go like, um, you know, let, let's, let's have people that, that do this all the time, just talk about the, the doing it part. I, I felt like, like you said, um, you know, the world is sort of obviously shifted. We no longer have, uh, you know, physical trade shows. We no longer have meetups where a lot of people were kind of just learning from each other and asking questions. Right. And, you know, we have, you know, newer generations of folks coming into the industry who, you know, stuff like Twitch or other ways of learning. I mean, you know, I look at my kids and it's like they learn everything through YouTube, right? They they learn. Yep. And so <clears throat> the, the challenge becomes like, how do you marry together this idea that like, we're all trying to constantly learn stuff. Um, you know, maybe the documentation's not perfect. Maybe there's follow up questions you have and like, how do we do that in some way? That's this mix of like, uh, I want to watch somebody else do it cause they're experts, but I also maybe want to ask some questions, but maybe I'm not comfortable going up to them live. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like you've kind of, you're starting to find that Venn diagram between all those things that we used to do sort of in real life, but maybe we weren't good at it. And, uh, you know, in this case, you have pulled this all together, uh, under the open shift brand, it's openshift.tv. But kind of walk through some of the things that you're learning about because you're creating content. You're helping to create content with some very, very technical people where you're doing hands on mm -hmm. demos. But other times mm -hmm. you're talking to practitioners and you're like, hey, what did you learn? Like, what are some of the learnings you've found over the last, I don't know, six months or so? Just maybe things. So you know, just what's going on? There's like this intense thirst for uh, human connection and learning at the same time. Right. Like people can single track their learning process through a number of sites right now, right? Like it's very easy to get started on Udemy or Khan Academy or any of these other sites to just go start learning. But when you have the experts on the line, right? And that's typically, you know, who's on the shows on OpenShift TV or who I live stream with is an expert on a certain topic. And having that person there demonstrating what they're doing and, oh, actually making a mistake and, oh, having to figure out how to fix it not only does it, you know, show a humanness to the person that is, quote, the expert, but it shows that person who's learning how that expert is troubleshooting, how that expert's going to, through the thinking process of why this broke, what should I check, where do I go next? That has been a huge and tremendous learning experience. And we've gotten to the point now where we just say we embrace failure on the channel because we learned so much from it as an audience. So that that I think has been a huge learning. Another thing is that like a lot of people think it's really weird we're doing this at all. Right. Like not weird in the sense of bad, but weird in the sense of, oh, my gosh, you're doing this and it's 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 for free. We don't have to pay or register or sign up. Well, technically, you have to register for a streaming service. But no, you you don't like this is stuff that we would put out into the universe anyway. We're just deciding to putting it out in the universe live and archiving it on YouTube for later use. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that's it's really just kind of taking the world we're in and turning lemons to lemonade. Right. That's what we're trying to do. Right. Right. Yeah. And I thought what was interesting is I thought, you know, <clears throat> for the people that listen to this show, you know, some of them come and tune in because they want to learn some things. And so they're, it's kind of one directional. Others, mm -hmm. I can imagine, go, hey, you know, maybe maybe we're rolling out a new project at work. 
and I want to be able to tell people about this, or I want to be able to convince people that it was a good investment. And so I was like, okay, let's let's dig into this a little bit more. Um, I'm curious, you know, like you mentioned, you you guys have created over 200 hours of content. How much of that is uh, you know really kind of technical content, right? Demos, you know, nerds talking oh, about gosh. bits and bytes, versus how much of it is stuff that maybe it's a little higher you know, kind of, I don't know, exec- so, executive level. And like, and like, why did you have to have a mix that you have? Yeah. So that, it, so our team is technical marketing managers, right? So we're going to have a technical audience. We sure. feel like, so we've designed, you know, technical first, but that's not the only thing we want on the channel, right? Like we want to appeal to more than just the people manning the keyboards every day or, and, 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 and the women hammering the keys and th- those that are out there just making the infrastructure go. We want to appeal to a broader audience than that because they're busy, right? <laughs> like right. most of the time, they're going to catch us after the show. So if they have a question, they're going to hit us up later and we make it, you know, ourselves accessible to that. But, you know, we have shows from across the spectrum, uh, including one in particular called In the Clouds with Red Hat Leadership, where we sit down every other Thursday to talk to either a distinguished engineer or a VP here at Red Hat to talk about what they, you know, the, where we are now, where they think we're going and how we're going to get there kind of thing. So we definitely have a, a large swath of technical content, but we also have content that meets the needs of people working in the public sector, right. people working in, you know, we're, you know, we starting this week or I'm sorry, next week, a show just for Red Hat Enterprise Linux folks, right? Like, so we're broadening our wings and, you know, we're adding an, uh, an open shift admin office hours because our developer office hours are so popular, right? So it's just, it's become this thing of its own that we're very proud of, but it's because we're bringing the right people to the, to the airwaves, essentially. Right. And people are latching on and watching. Right. Now, I know one thing uh, sort of surprised me a little bit. You know, anytime you start something new, people immediately are like, okay, you know, how popular it is that they want some metric around it. And mm-hmm. and instead of you guys, instead of just purely going for like, hey, you know, how many views did we have? You're, you're kind of measuring yourself based on, A, how many people show up. And that's always sort of an easy thing. But then you've been measuring kind of engagements, right? Like how much are people right. asking questions? Like how easy do you talk a little bit about how you think about the metrics that go with it? Because I think that's that's always an important thing for people to feel like, am I doing something that's successful or helpful or, or whatever? So for me, I mean, I've been on the show before. I have a deep DevOps <laughs> background, right? So metrics right. are everything for me, right? Like if I can measure something, awesome. If I can measure myself against something else, even better. And the coolest thing I think about Twitch in general is that all the stats APIs are wide open. So there's all these sites out there for Twitch specifically where you can just go get the data for any channel. And and the data is enormous. Sites like sullynome.com and Twitch Tracker. There's so much statistical data you can gather. But we particularly are interested in, in three metrics. Hours of content produced, yes, that shows a a total body of work, right? Yep. From the whole from the whole channel. But like you could produce two hundred hours of fluff. That's entirely possible, right, right. right? So what we also measure is chats per stream. How many chat messages do we get per stream? And on average, that engagement is usually pretty high. Um, and that I think is what's most important because you know, I can bring people, you know, I Sure, I can have 3,000 people register and 1,000 people show up and, you know, we get those people to show up. But are they networking? Are they interacting with each other? Are they missing that physical component, right? That's what we kind of looked at. Like, what replaces that physical component of being at a meetup or at an event kind of thing? And we said, well, chat. Chat definitely does. So we measure the chat messages and per stream, and that's all open metrics that you can go grab, you know, straight off the Twitch API yourself if you'd like. Uh, and then we have what I call the golden number, which is hours watched or hours watched per hour of content produced. And this mm. one is hard for me to explain because it's a ratio and I'm bad at math. But for every hour of content we produce, it gets watched 32 times. That is okay. an enormous amount of people watching an hour of content, right? So. And a lot of that comes from Twitch, which 
is our smallest network, right? But it just happened to be where we started the first 20 episodes. And then we added on another a service called Restream.io, which is a godsend for anybody in the streaming business. If you have to do this professionally, I highly recommend it. But what it does is it allows you to stream to multiple services at once with a single with a single host, a single stream, and you can just aggregate that chat as well because it has a bot that works in the back end that just says, oh, somebody's talking on Facebook. Well, here it is in chat, in chat on Twitch and YouTube and Periscope and everywhere else. And that way, you just come to wherever you're comfortable, be yeah. it Twitch or Periscope or YouTube. You can chat with everybody else wherever they are. And you're building a community at that point. And we have seen regulars start popping up. And we've actually sent some gifts off to people and gotten some people in the KubeCon EU because of their engagement on the channel and because the channel wouldn't be the same without them. So we really appreciate our regular viewers for sure. Yeah, very, very cool. Let's uh, let's dive a little bit into the tech. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we won't go into, you know, all the all the bits of it. But, you know, for people that might be saying, hey, that this is interesting, I might want to set this stuff up like. What are maybe what are a couple of the, the technology basics that you need beyond just what everybody's been doing lately, which is like, oh, I'm trying to have a better microphone and maybe a little better camera view so because people see me on video. But like, right. what, are, what are some of those technical things that you found that help keep people engaged or just, you know, you get better feedback from people about the, the experience? So I, I look at radio often, right? And then you look at podcasting too, and, and kind of the same way like dead air is bad, right? right. Like you have, to, you have to have something on air, right? Like people have to be talking or some kind of in, some, something to keep people's attention going constantly, right? right? Like so my job as a host or a producer is to keep that conversation moving at all times, right? So that's usually the – so the way it was explained to me is, you know, the order of the way things matter – is the content matters first, mm -hmm. the audio matters second, the video matters third, and it's a distant third. No one really cares if the video is uh, a little grainy unless you're trying to display something, right? Like right. no one, it, it, just as long as that content is good and clear, you'll be good. Um, so we actually have a, a cloud platform streaming repo where we keep all of our streaming docs, our, our OBS assets, uh, you know, you name it, it's there. Uh, and we found that, you know, having those docs out there and accessible to everybody is helpful. Uh, you know, we have a particular one for, you know, personas. We call it, we have, you know, three different personas, guest producers and streamers. Um, that tech, we try to keep dead simple. Yeah. That, that, you know, right? Like, so I use, and I recommend to other folks because who knows what you have tech-wise. I use an 8th gen i3 Intel Nook to stream from Fedora to restream to all the different services. And then I just have my Mac, work-issued Mac, sitting over here on the other desk where I have my Mac, you know nice camera and mic hooked up and everything. But in theory, on a powerful enough box, you can do it all from one machine. But... OBS runs on one box behind me. That's that i3, you know, 8th gen i3 Intel Nook. That's all you need to stream. You don't need anything super fancy unless you're trying to do, like, game streaming or anything like that, right? Like, you do not need to go overboard to do this. Remember, there are 15-year-olds that are doing this with their iPhones. So, <laughs> right, like, right. like, that was the whole intent, right? Like, we're not going to spend a ton of money on this. You know, we have all the skills and capabilities and tooling essentially you need. And we even have a, um, in that repo a, a equipment guide that I need to update real quick. But uh, a mic arm broke that it was in the suggested guide, so I have to replace <laughs> that. Uh, um, uh, but the the even the, the equipment guide has like a high, medium, low kind of like price scale. And right. all of it's designed to fit within like under $250 threshold. Right. And then I mentioned that, like, I have this other bespoke setup over here, which is insane if you're doing, like, live streaming on a constant basis. Um, but, you know, most people can get by with, I don't recommend, you know, the Blue Yeti mics because they pick up everything. But, like, a, not, a decent road mic and a decent set of wired headphones and you're off and running, right? right? Like, right. That's, that's all you need, right? Like, the webcam in your laptop, probably good enough. If you want a 1080p webcam... Good luck finding one. Right. Uh, I, I hear, you know, like they, they might be back in stock places. But yeah, like there's we try to keep the tech simple as possible. We have everyone dial into Zoom. And then from there, I, you know, we use OBS to capture that screen, add our overlays and effects and everything else we want and then broadcast that out. 
Right. And that just keeps it simple from, you know, getting people on air is hard enough doing all the coordination and everything. When you start asking them, okay, now turn on Skype for audio. Okay. Now for video, turn on this and da, 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 you know, no offense to the, the, uh, I just did a podcast where they were using Jitsi meat for the first time to like just manage feeds and stream and everything else. And I was like, this is not the best experience for me right now because people kept freezing and we had to kept restarting and so forth. So on there's great open source tools out there. Jitsi is a great tool, but you got to like know what you're doing with it right and so we kind of want to eliminate that that toil that that bar to entry that barrier to entry we want to keep that very low for our guests so you know we've we basically say if you if you know if you're a guest all you have to do is you know please use wired headphones if you got them uh and then just show up to the zoom call like right. you have everything you need to do a meeting you have everything you need to do a live stream right, right? right. like that's that's essentially what we're at yeah, and it's you know I, I think what you really hit on, and you know if anybody's sort of listening to this and they're going, hey, this might be a cool way for me to you know work with colleagues or start up a new community or something, I, I think you hit on the really important things. It's it's sort of the same stuff we've learned from doing the podcast forever, and 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 they follow kind of the same pattern, which is number one, um, you know, make content that other people would think is interesting, or you know, mm-hmm. first thing, you make it so that you think it's interesting because you probably have an understanding of your audience, but make content that's interesting. Do it frequently enough that people know when it is, right? They can kind of build mm-hmm. their schedule around it. Um, audio is really important. Like if your audio is poor, people will just stop listening because it's like, oh, it hurts, hurts my yeah. head, whatever. And yeah, video is video is a distant third, fourth, fifth or something, right? Like people, yeah. you know, a lot of learning. I mean, unless you're showing like a UI or something, right? Yeah. Like they don't care. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, if you're, if you're getting into it and that's you know, that's part of where the, the feedback comes back. It becomes sort of two way. If you're like, Hey man, I, I couldn't see what you were doing there or what you typed. Could you, but yeah. you know, you think about that and it's, you're like, it's no different. It's than interesting. Being... You mentioned feedback though. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. No, you, no, but go like ahead. we, we just did, we just finished this morning, uh, another episode of our developer experience office hours where we bring on, uh, one, someone from our UX team who very much lives in the future. We actually call her Serena from the future because we have to always put a disclaimer like what you see on screen right now might not actually end up in the product the way you see it or at all for that matter. So, you know, we get feedback on our product live on air from people that are just tuning in. And people love that show because they know that if they make a suggestion in that show that's really good, it's going to end up in the product. Yeah. Right. Cool. Like, so that's why they tune into that office hours for developers. Well, we want the same experience for, you know, the admin side. So we're starting a show for the admin folks and the, you know, for the admin view itself and getting that feedback into the program and everything. We've done polling. We've done, you know, all kinds of like gamification of things and creating point systems and things like that. Like, it's a lot harder than you think to get to that yeah. like, next level of, you know, streaming sure. superstarness. But for us, it's just, you know, we're, we're iteratively working away at this, trying to make it the best thing we can. And it's not like we have budget or people set aside for it, right? Like, I'm a TMM. My right. boss said, this is your job now. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, that's basically what happened. I got reassigned to do this. And it is a full-time job. I will not, absolutely not ever say that. It Like, somebody or a team of people could do this on their own. I do feel like the amount of coordination it takes is should and probably will always exist with one maybe two people but like i don't like open sourcing committee like a live streaming network is hard yeah. right yeah, yeah. so yeah, you gotta so- have somebody willing to say no that content's going to be better than this content based off these metrics that we've had in the past and like right. you have to have that familiarity right right yeah well i mean without maybe without giving away <clears throat> maybe all of your secrets have you found that uh you know certain formats tend to to I don't know, be more popular. Like I know you do a lot of, uh, ask me anything where you'll have, say, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of product managers come and people ask questions. I know you do some live demonstrations. You do like, are you finding certain formats or, you know, attract different kinds of people or work better or like what, what's maybe what, what drives success, uh, maybe mm-hmm. other than other things. If, yeah. if you a can good that com- out. A good camaraderie between all the people on the call mm-hmm. drives success, yeah. right? Like, um, and I always, 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 even if I know all the people already know each other, I always built in a little buffer time, about 15 minutes before you'll get that invite from me before yeah. your schedule go, go live time. And it's like, what is that for? And I tell people, you know, hey, I have to make sure your AV and everything's set up. But what I'm also doing is like, 
Hey, how you doing today? Yep. Hey, a long time. You know, I'm building the and establishing like the the rapport and trying to get the mood of the room kind of thing. And so that way everybody feels a little bit more comfortable. Right. Like my job as a producer or a host is to make sure I get the best possible person that's on air at that moment. So, um, you know, making people feel comfortable is what I do in that early 15 minute window. Then that way, when it is just, you know, one or two people, it's super easy. When it's five people, that gets a little different because you might have somebody that's never been on the show before, right, never right. been on the channel ever, right? Like, where do they fit into the puzzle? There's these regulars here. And, like, getting that person to be comfortable is my goal, right? Yep. So you have to build the psychological safety even on the live stream. Even if it only takes a few minutes, you still have to do it. Right, 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 right. Yeah, DevSec streaming ops or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hug, hug streaming ops. Let me ask you yeah. one last question before I let you go because I know you're busy. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we talked at the beginning. You uh, you spent some time as a CNCF ambassador. You are around mm -hmm. communities a ton. Um, have you had any conversations yet with um, some of the events people as, you know, you're learning more about this. It's kind of becoming successful, like, do you think we'll start to see some of this into the bigger shows? Are there going to be opportunities so, to weave it in? Yeah. So actually, uh, next week we are doing, you know, normally we do a what's new in version, you know, X dot Y yeah. uh, release uh, call next week. We're actually doing that live for everyone for the first time on the channel. So you will learn what's new in four, six at the same time as the rest of it. Red Hat does uh, in OpenShift 4.6. So that I think is kind of like a, it's a it's a big win for me because the fact the fact that the the PMs the product management team sees value in doing it that way is tremendous. We'll see if it works out in the long term, but right. you know it's an experiment. All of this is an experiment at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've kind of. You know, it's and, well, it, like and just having, going down that rabbit hole is yeah, just and, a long, long way to go. <laughs> and, and, well, and having lived through those things internally, I mean, those are typically, you know, a couple hour presentations. There's, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people attending. And that's for an internal thing. Yeah, you open up that to, you know, a much broader number of people. It's it's going to be very interesting to sort of watch yeah. the moderation of questions and, you know, how comfortable people are with sharing stuff. I know, you know, Red Hat's always pretty transparent about stuff, but yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a good experiment. It's very, very cool. Well, listen, yeah. man, um, any, any last plugs you want to sort of, uh, you know, where can people find all this? So we talked about OpenShift TV, but like if people yeah, want like to Yeah, like OpenShift.tv is the site. Um, if you, you know, interact with us on, on Twitter, uh, it's just twitter.com slash OpenShift. Um, you can hit me up, C Short at Red Hat or on Twitter as well, Chris Short. You know, suggest ideas all you want. We have a stream form, just red.ht slash stream form. If you have an idea for a show, like if you're a customer or a partner or whatever, you want to come off and demo something you've done potentially, I'm all ears. You know, if if it sounds good, we'll bring you on. You know, it, we love having our customers and partners on. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah, we love having everybody on, but yeah, especially our customers, right? Yeah. So, yeah, please feel free to, you know, volunteer to come on the channel. We'll you know, have you on and you'll have some awesome video afterwards. It'll be a, you know, nice little experience for you. I guarantee it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Chris <laughs> is, uh, I, I, I can, I can vouch for it and not just cause, uh, not just cause he's a colleague and teammate. The, the guys do a great job with this. I highly recommend it. If you're, if you're interested just in the space, it don't have, to, doesn't have to be OpenShift specific. It's, you know, it's Kubernetes, it's cloud native, it's, mm -hmm. you know, DevSecOps. It's, it's all the things that I think people turn into the cloud and you know, tune into the cloudcast for anyway. So very cool. Chris, uh, with that again, as always, thank you for, uh, for the time today. Thanks for teaching us some new stuff, folks. As always, thank you for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for you know rating the show and giving us feedback. And if you haven't uh, told a friend or haven't rated the show, we'd love to to hear your feedback. Um, you know, show at thecloudcast.net always lets you uh, you know give us feedback on on what you want to hear next or guests or uh, you know suggestions for who should be on. So with that, we'll wrap it up and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 